So I'm Sean Tier. I'm running uh, for district attorney. I've been in that office for a total of 13 years, uh, 11 as a prosecutor. Uh, the last seven, um, six and a half, I was a supervisor of our vehicular crimes division and a part of our felony trial bureau division. Um, I've supervised well over a hundred different attorneys during that time. Um, I have trained the vast majority of the office as it's currently um, comprised um, in different aspects. Uh, I've taught throughout the state and the country on different techniques and, and avenues of prosecution. Um, I have handled personally every kind of case in that office from Class C traffic tickets up to capital murders and everything in between. Um, I have the faith and the trust of the rank and file prosecutors. They want to work for me. Um, we're hemorrhaging good attorneys every day. Uh, the, the amount of experience and talent that we've lost since 2017 is staggering. Um, and the vast majority of them aren't leaving to go get rich doing criminal defense work or civil work. They're going to other jurisdictions. They still want to do this job. They still believe in the mission of a prosecutor to see that justice is served in every case. They just don't want to do it at the Harris County DA's office under the current leadership. I'm running to restore the integrity, to restore the competence in that office. Um, what, what we've seen in the last seven and a half years is mismanagement, losses in high profile critical cases, and the stuff that doesn't make the news. We're losing murders, we're losing aggravated robberies, we're losing sex assaults at a, at a clip that we've never ever seen. And what that's doing is making us all less safe. And so I'm running to fix that. And I'm excited to be here. I'm Kim Ogg. I am your Harris County District Attorney, and I have been for the last seven years. I have 36 years of legal experience. In that time, I have operated or run or participated in literally every different role in the criminal justice system from line prosecutor to defense lawyer, uh, policy advisor for the city of Houston mayor's office on gangs and youth crime. I've run a nonprofit, uh, Crime Stoppers, which is running a small business and managed employees there. I operated grant funded programs when I worked at the city that I obtained. So I had an experience with government entities and utilizing public-private partnerships to attack problems with solutions that didn't cost government very much money. And I really excelled at that at the city and at Crime Stoppers and we expanded the footprint of both. Um, the city's office was brand new, Crime Stoppers was not, but I expanded its footprint and we made it much more successful. We had two years where we caught over a thousand fugitives or solved crimes in each year. Those were world records. When I went into private practice, I had to learn the business of law. And so I had to learn to bill, I had to learn to attract clients, recruit, retain, and still win cases. Um, it was a real expansion in my world. I'd always worked for the government. So I had the opportunity to work for a civil firm and I then worked with my dad, which um, if any of you have been in the family business is very challenging. And I found it uh, really rewarding. I was so surprised. I had a great time. Um, when Mike Anderson passed away, I ran for district attorney. I announced almost immediately uh, right after his wife was appointed by the governor. And I ran from September of 13 until I won in November of 2016. So I ran for three years and three months. Um, during that time period, I learned a lot about being an elected person or being, being a candidate for elected office, let me say that. And it was quite different than growing up in politics, which I'd done. Um, it was, it again required me to really grow in my skill set. So as the district attorney, I came to the job with a lot of varied experience, some ideas that were really strongly held about what should be done with our system. And I run now a very, very different office 
than existed in Harris County District Attorney history. The office is far more diverse. It's really focused on violent crime, but we've gotten that bandwidth by treating the nonviolent, lower level offenders differently than we ever treated them in Harris County before. So now we have programs to actually divert the mentally ill and treat them. We have programs to actually counsel and educate juveniles and their families, also their um, peers at school. And we've treated drug offenders through changes in drug policy completely different. Um, I started at a time when there was a huge violent crime crisis in the late 80s. I saw the revolving door as part of the victims' rights movement to change that. We enjoyed a safer time after about mid-1990s until about 2018, and then we started to see some real changes in violent crime. And the reasons for it are multifaceted. There's no silver bullet. But we saw a huge increase in 20 and 21. It had started to creep up in 18. The increase had to be dealt with at a time when the DA's office was at an all-time um, disadvantage. We were out of the courthouse because of Harvey, and we were in a worldwide pandemic, which meant most people were working from home. We were essential. Our lawyers at intake our staff, our investigators carried on. So I led that office through COVID and through Harvey. And we have, during the seven years, done many things that are extraordinary. We've taken more people off death row than we've put on, which for Harris County, the killingest county in America, is a sea change. Um, in addition to diversifying the office, we have worked hard to retain the people that we have. I'll address Mr. Tears' uh, accusations or platform at, at a later time, but what I would say is that the office runs in a professional way. The um, problems that we face are being faced by elected district attorneys everywhere. They're solvable. The crime problem is solvable. And so I'm running for a third term because I think we've done a good job at the low level with offenders and doing something in the alternative with them as opposed to just jailing and imprisoning them. And I think we have a lot more work to do in terms of clearing the violent criminals that either are in custody or out on bail. So it's just unfinished business. I want to talk about bail and bail reform because I think that's an issue where you both have um, kind of distinct views. Um, DA Og, you, it, two years ago, you said that bail reform was a driving factor in the crime crisis gripping our community. And that was at a time, as you noted, where crime was really starting to uh, increase. It's starting to go down now, thankfully. It's not where we want it to be, but I'm curious if you still feel strongly that, that bail reform is contributing to, to violent crime in, in our county. There is a tendency to take things that I've said and sort of put them to the extreme. I don't know that I said it is the driving force, and I'm not sure that you said that. It is a force in that repeat violent offenders were being released in numbers that we had not seen, and it did compromise public safety in that we had violent crimes committed by violent criminals. We had some repeat offenders. Example, we have one that has nine. Uh, we recently tried him, took five years. He got 35 years, theft of wheels. Um, he had nine subsequent offenses, each time arrested, charged, released, all the same, theft of wheels. It was a organized crime operation. So his release, his continued release for the same offense did produce more crime in that particular instance. Bail is a pretrial tool used by the court to supervise defendants. It's in the Constitution. It's something that, while I don't believe anybody should be in prison just because they don't have the money to get out, public safety has been my concern with bail always. It is generally the job of the prosecutor to argue for the public safety of the community. If the risks are low and the offender is likely to come back to court, 
then just like I did in 2017, we generally agree to a personal recognizance, or now they call them GOB bond. And that's par for the course. It's kind of routine in Harris County. It's not kind of routine, it is routine. Almost all misdemeanor offenders get pre-signed GOB bonds. I didn't oppose that. I actually agreed to it. Where I diverged was felony bail reform. And you'll hear from some that felony bail reform was done informally. Some will say it wasn't done at all. But it did occur simultaneously with the formal implementation of misdemeanor bail reform. And so there is one other thing I'd like to say about bail reform. It's a term of art, not of law. Some people in our community think bail reform means keeping dangerous offenders who are high risk off the streets through the imposition of bail. So securing people's return to court and the safety of the public through the imposition of sufficient bonds is something I support in violent cases, including domestic violence and even risk to the community. When you, you talk about felony bail reform being applied informally, I mean, can you, can you be a little bit more specific about what you mean there? Because there is no official policy, as you noted. There are There's a practice, sir. And I haven't called it informal. I'm quoting a, a, a person that I heard call it informal felony bail reform. In fact, in practice, it did occur. It started in 2017 with some district court judges, but it really came to fruition in 19 after the 2018 elections. We had a judicial uh, philosophy that I think changed the playing field uh, tremendously. And we did see a massive change in the amounts of bonds, in the conditions of bond, in the um, use of bond to secure a person's appearance or the community's safety. And it was not across the board, but it was absolutely a sea change from how it had been before. I think you just said that your, your, the area where you diverged was on felony bail reform and practice. Uh, but that's not my memory. My memory is that actually you evolved on, on misdemeanor bail reform and then you came out at some point saying it, it is a contributor, you know, it is a major contributor to the crime that we were seeing. I did not believe that misdemeanor bail was a contributor. Included in that report were examples of felonies. What we did is I took a legal remedy. I filed an amicus brief with the, fe with the federal court in the O'Donnell case. I did that not because I didn't believe in misdemeanor bail, but the proposed settlement was not what had been discussed at the roundtables that I had been part of. The $94 million fiscal note that had zero dollars for the DA's office, even though we were expected to be at bond hearings 24-7. That's, it's the, it's the, it was the, what's the right word? It was the implementation of it that I objected to. I'm talking about uh, when you came out with a study from your office yeah. Um, saying that your findings were not what the independent mo um, monitors were finding. Different report, sorry. One was an amicus brief, which was filed with the court. One was a report. And the monitors, we didn't feel that the monitors' information was accurate on failure to appear, on repeat violent offenses involving domestic violence, and some DWI. That's that was the thrust of the report. Do you, do you still, I mean, have, have you taken issue with their subsequent data that they've, they've released? That was a couple of years ago at this point. So. Yeah, I think that the data that's being presented regarding return to court, they'll tell you it's not accurate, and it's because the courts don't have a uniform way of measuring it. So it's not that I'm opposing them. Their methodology was not reflecting what we saw, period. So we brought it to their attention through a series of letters and through a report. I think we did two reports. And yeah, I thought that in domestic violence, in DWI, even in the, the release of uh, misdemeanor offenders, that that did contribute to some violence. And that was the gist of the report. Um, 18 bonds for somebody, misdemeanor bonds. I think that contributes in part 
to crime. I think the word spread among the criminal element that there really were no consequences for certain things and that that did contribute in part to crime. But is that the driving factor? It is not. There were many. Mr. Chair, what is your response to her position on uh, bail? What we all just saw is a pattern of what my opponent does in every situation all the time. It's never her fault. She just, without saying specific names, attacked the judges, the felony judges, for implementing what she calls felony bail reform. Um, it's not accurate. She just used the nine, the person out on nine different felony bonds. After the second, it's the DA's fault. Ask her how many times during those nine offenses when he was released and granted another bond, did they move forward on an 11B motion? Zero. Tell us again. An 11B motion is the vehicle in the state constitution which allows a judge to hold an individual at no bond if they are out on a bond for a felony case where they have been indicted. In this case, eight separate times we had an opportunity to hold that individual at no bond. We didn't do it. After the first time, it's not the judge's fault anymore. It's the DA's fault. And in every one of these cases, that's what you see. The vast majority of the district court judges, they're people that I've worked with. They're friends of mine. They want to hold people who are a danger to the community in custody. They absolutely do. The Constitution does not let them do it by themselves, despite the way that it has been practiced in Harris County forever, up until 2018, where judges did it and weren't held accountable. The judges that came in in 18 decided to follow the law, which is going to require us to pivot and actually participate, which means going forward on the 11B motions. So just think about it. Every time that we see man on 14 bonds commits murder, 13 of those opportunities were missed at the DA's office. I was in the felony trial bureau for six years. I absolutely know that we are not going forward on these motions in the way we should. But that's just the beginning because cases are languishing for five years. What we have to do is stop attacking the other stakeholders, the judges, commissioners, court. We've got to build coalitions. We've got to work together in order to shorten the time from arrest to conviction or disposition of the case, however that happens. We can't continue to go forward the way we're going because we need to hold some of these people that are a danger to the community in custody until their day in court. So we've got to stop requiring every single defendant to go to a jury trial. If they want the judge to assess punishment after a court trial, we should be doing it. We can do those in a much shorter fashion. And she's going to turn and pivot and talk about the crime labs and their inability to get cases to us in a timely fashion. But what we have to do is work with them. We don't need to go and start spouting off to the media and effectively calling for Dr. Stout's resignation. We've got to work with them. Right? We've got to continue to go all about it. And 270 days is the length of time that we have right now for a ballistics case. We're not trying to murder in a year, but we sure as heck shouldn't be trying to murder in four years. We need to go somewhere in between. And if we're trying the street rental unauthorized use of motor vehicles, if we're trying the burglary of the buildings that typically don't require labs to do, if we're trying those in three months and four months to get that individual either to TDC, to state jail, to a diversion program, or to county jail, if we're doing that in the amount of time like that, our jail is in this full. We're not killing as many people in there. And we have the bandwidth. The labs have the bandwidth to take care of the serious cases. So all of these are group efforts to get better. But what you will never hear today, what you haven't heard in seven and a half years, is the elected DA admit that she is a part of the problem and in some cases, the problem.
there are two chapters in chapter 11 or two subsets in chapter 11 of the Texas Constitution 11a motion which allows a judge to hold someone at no bond for 60 days and you have to prove a number of things they're a danger to the community they're a flight risk but there's an 11b motion and that is only triggered if someone is out on a felony bond that has been indicted and you go and show that they violated a condition of that bond typically the one that we utilize the most in that is they probable cause has been found that they have picked up a new charge and it can be anything from class b misdemeanor technically it can be a class c misdemeanor but typically we go forward class b misdemeanor and above okay so you were a prosecutor so why weren't y'all um, requesting that hearing or filing that motion in vehicular crimes we did it pretty routinely in the in the case of the woman that killed sergeant ramon gutierrez the sheriff's the sheriff's deputy the sh sheriff's sergeant we filed an 11b motion for her because she tested positive for alcohol in her scram device we went through a two-day um a two-day hearing in front of at that time or current name associate judge stacy allen stacy allen barrow um, who is currently running for i believe 487 it was exactly what we needed to do. We put on evidence that she violated the condition of Vermont and she was a continuing danger because she was drinking and she had killed a police officer while she was drinking. Uh, and so we went forward on that. We have gone forward on 11B motions, uh, but in trial bureau, it is not something that we were even, even told to do. Um, it's something that we did in my division, and I believe if you pulled the records, I was, I was asking and requiring my prosecutors to do it more than the rest of the courts. So, Ms. Al, do you have a, um, a policy on this? Why wouldn't that be done with more regularity? The cases are handled individually by individual prosecutors under supervision by people much like my opponent. He was a division chief, and I would submit to you that there were probably as many 11B motions filed in other divisions as in my opponent's division. When he says we did it pretty regularly, the truth is the prosecutors decide what they have the bandwidth to do. So on high profile, dangerous, high risk offenders, it is done. We file motions for sufficient bond. In every case, we filed over 18,000 of them. To go in and request a hearing, Often our prosecutors will tell me they do, they can't get a hearing or they can't get a hearing quickly and they go to grand jury instead. There is a delay with the evidence and there is a concern about presenting a case without full evidence even at the bond hearing stage. So our prosecutors are, I wouldn't say they're told uh, to do it or not do it. We're trying to protect public safety. So if they think that's in the best interest and they have the bandwidth to do it, they do it. But we don't triage every single case. Um, and I would suggest to you that uh, if that was my opponent's theory, uh, then you should have done it. Well, I do want to clarify one additional thing. She brought up motions for sufficient bail. Another mistruth that she just told you all was that she doesn't oppose misdemeanor bail reform. She stood up and opposed it at the final hearing of the O'Donnell decree, and she's continued to oppose it through her actions up to this day with her motions for sufficient bail. Go pull every misdemeanor bond that is granted at the magistrate courts. The DA's office is asking for cash bail, despite the O'Donnell decree in almost every single one of them with those motions for sufficient bail. Through her actions, she is directly opposing what she told you, that she doesn't oppose misdemeanor cash bail reform. It is, it's just not the truth. When did that begin? Has that always been the case? The motion for sufficient, I'm sorry, the motion for sufficient bail Began, I want to say 2019. So, response? We let our prosecutors make the decisions both at intake in the section that deals with 1517 hearings and in the trial court about how they're going to handle the bail situation. So, with 105 now thousand cases pending, plus another 2,000 in juvenile court, they're going to best assess where to pick their battles 
which courts to do it in, what cases to do it in. And we look to our supervisory chain of authority to give guidance and provide leadership when it should be done, especially if it's not being done. But I find that um, the individual judgment of the prosecutors, as long as they are properly supervised, that's what we're after. We can't micromanage every case, so we rely upon the training we've provided them and the supervision that we try to provide them uh, to make the best decision based on their judgment at the time. And if they don't know what to do, they're supposed to walk it up the chain. So you'll see it in quite a few cases, but not all, much like my opponent said. So about misdemeanor bond, I'm sorry, about misdemeanor bond, same thing. We're dealing with stalking, with DWI. So I would expect in the cases involving public safety that they would. In the cases not involving public safety, I would think they wouldn't, not unless there's some major repeated criminal history. That would be my thought. But I don't monitor who's filing which motions. I just know that on the whole, I'm tracking how many motions we're filing, how are we doing on those motions, are we winning those motions, are they or losing those motions, that kind of thing. And the bulk of the sufficient bail requests that we file are not granted. I understand, Mr. Teer, your, your position on her taking responsibility, but are you really saying that, um, that, that uh, felony court judges did not implement policies that resembled felony uh, bail reform? Are you really saying that the that the crime labs don't have delays? Of course not. No, no, no. The crime labs have delays. And, and we've been dealing with delays in the crime lab at least since 2005 when I started inside that office. It's not new. We've always dealt with some eccentric judges. Um, and that's no different than today. The judges that came in in 2018 had a different approach and a different philosophy than the judges we had worked under and in front of um, for decades. What is incumbent on us as an independent organization is to adapt and to do so ethically and to do so within the realms of decor as officers of the court. And if they are requiring us to put on evidence to hold dangerous people at no bond, then that's what we have to do. And so the, the overt attacks, the constant barrage of attacks on the judiciary has not only hurt and eroded the public trust of the whole criminal justice system, it has hurt our relationship with every other stakeholder. And it goes directly to the type of leader that has to be in that position. Someone who is not prone to attacks, personal attacks, public attacks. Someone who can work and decide and work through issues collaboratively. That's what we have to have. I've worked under five different elected DAs or interim district attorneys in my time. I've seen good leaders and I've seen bad leaders. I, I got to tell a little story about that. When Chuck Rosenthal was or resigned amidst the, the scandals, it was a ship without a rudder. We were all, I was a young prosecutor and we were all just kind of adrift. Ken Magidson was appointed. He came in. He was the epitome to those of us in the trenches, the rank and file, of someone who understood how to calm the waters and right the ship. He would walk the halls, not to check and see if you were working, not to do anything. As a young misdemeanor prosecutor, I vividly remember two separate instances in that year where he just sat down in my office, five minutes tops, just asking me how things were going, talking to me, and got up and went about and did, did it somewhere else. He would come in and work a docket once a month. One misdemeanor docket, 
the next month you go do a felony dust. Those kind of little things endear your working, the people that work for you, to you. They make them want to work for you. That's how you retain talent. That's how you go about being a leader. And the other part of that is to not attack every single other group, but to work with them. If you have differences, go work it out and come back and work towards things. We understand a lot of the factors going on. I mean, some of the turnover is because people have way too many cases because you can't get the funding to hire uh, more prosecutors. We understand the delays in the crime lab. The judges, in my opinion, have made irresponsible decisions. Um, but what responsibility do you take for you know some of the problems at the DA's office? Well, I'm the top law enforcement official in the county, and so I work uh, at the top of a pyramid that's built on the shoulders of about 850 employees. Every act that they take, especially in including the 350 assistant district attorneys, is done in my name. I'm responsible for every single act that our employees commit, whether I knew about it whether I did it or not. That was also true at Crime Stoppers. That was true in my law firm. That was true at the mayor's anti-gang office. So we're all responsible for our own actions. I'm responsible for the policy changes that we have brought to the DA's office. I was responsible for changing the culture, which is one of the campaign promises that I ran on. To do that, I let 16 members of leadership go and another 18 go below the ranks of leadership after they'd done things that I thought as a lawyer were questionable that either been written up in an appeal or the, not an appeal, I'm sorry, that either been written up by court or they'd done something that had been covered uh, that was, that appeared unethical. So to change the culture, I did let a lot of people go. And that bred some animosity, especially among what we call the old school. Um, when we changed the intake policies to make it a full-time job instead of a part-time job, full-time job for about 45 people, part-time job for 350, the old school prosecutors were angry. We weren't paying overtime. They didn't want to work, and they didn't want it to be full-time. So I've faced those internal, what are described as morale issues, and what I would say is the convulsions caused by a pretty big sea change in the people that I brought in, the policies that I brought in. I'm responsible for all of that. But I find that these discussions about recruiting, retaining, are, are really not reality. Morale is in large part driven by money, salaries, work-life balance, your atmosphere, the reception that you get, and of course leadership is part of that. But with 850 employees, you don't have a personal relationship with each and every one, although it would be great, but we just don't. So what I would suggest is that for all the actions of the DA's office for the last seven years, I am entirely responsible. Um, but we play a key component. We're the front door. We're the linchpin of the criminal justice system. But we are not the judges. We don't set bail. We don't set the schedule for trials. I'm also not the crime lab. And by the way, I did not call for the resignation of Peter Stout. But there are major problems at the city lab, again. And they have to be dealt with. Sometimes your um, your very your assertiveness is not is not appreciated in commissioners' court. They don't respond well to it, um, and it's not helping you get what you want. What what do you say to people who see your style and say that it's not productive? I would say that the results show that I am productive, and I have won a number of those battles. Most of my life as a professional woman, I've been told, you know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. 
And I'll tell you that once I had full confidence in myself, my position backed up by evidence, that I believe in an adversarial system. You cannot be perceived as unprepared, weak, uncertain about your position. So while some people may disfavor my style, I would suggest to you I wouldn't be the DA unless I'd fought for every single case, client, policy, position, partnership. I didn't negate negotiation, but I'm just a strong advocate for public safety, and I'll never apologize for it. When my opponent says we're losing cases right and left, I'll remind him the object of the game was justice, and we want to win, but we don't always win. And what you'll hear me say is we respect the jury's verdict. We respect the grand jury's decision. We respect the judge's determination about the evidence. This attack on judges. You won't find me criticizing a judge by name anywhere about a particular case. But about danger to the community, yes, I have rung the alarm bell. Is that an attack? No, it's my job. I represent almost five million people. I'm their chief law enforcement officer. I'm the person they expect to have the answers. So when I tell the truth in a way that's not pleasing to the public because I'm a strong woman or because I don't use the right tone or there's a perception because others are fighting with me that I'm fighting with them. But I'll tell you is it's an adversarial system and I'm a trial lawyer and now I'm in charge of a lot of important policies and people and I want to do the right thing. So I fight for them. The rank and file police officers that I have worked with over the years know who I am as a prosecutor. Bad people, the predators that are out there preying on our communities for the first time in a number of years are going to be held accountable. That is something that I commit to you, to your readers, to our entire community. Soft on crime is not, that's just, that's a buzzword. I'm going to be smart on crime. Justice and public safety are not independent of each other. We can save people. I want to work with the trade unions. I want to scrap all of the probation conditions that exist strictly to act as lay away to put people in prison later. Let's give an opportunity for change and hope. Let's work with these unions. Let's work with other trades to say, look, you've got an infrastructure built up already. I'm going to give you a two-year pretrial diversion, a two-year deferred adjudication. And if your journeyman that is training you as an apprentice comes back and says this person is on the right track, why do I want to make that person a criminal? If we save 20, 25% of those individuals down the road and you exponentially grow that group, you don't have the violent criminals anymore that are posted up outside the Galleria, but you've got to also be able to handle them. And that's the way that I want to go forward with this office. And I've got a lot of plans and a lot of ideas, but you can't make them happen unless you retain and keep talent and morale. And I don't care how many times my opponent says it, it's never been lower and there's never been less experience there. And I'm gonna change that too.